Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school program um, and Interay Foundation are excited to have you join us for our live webinar series, looking at ocean science and technology um, with experts. And this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science, what's happening in the field, interesting careers, and more. And today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Brian LaPointe of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University about his research on sargassum. But before we get started, we're going to tell you just quickly a little bit about our programs. The Scientist in Every Florida School program is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of SEFS is to engage K-12 teachers and students in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today. And we hope that these will inspire you to be future stewards of our planet. The Anjari Foundation, oops, the Anjari Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65 foot research vessel known as the RV Anjari. In case you missed any of the information in today's preview slides, we'll remind you that you can ask and submit questions to our scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also provide a feedback form and survey at the end of today's presentation, and we would love for you to take part in that. So at this time, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Brian LaPointe, who will tell us about himself, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and its impacts. And so at this time, Dr. LaPointe, I'm going to stop share so that you can share your slides and take it from here. Thank you. All right, well, thank you uh, for that introduction. And let me share my screen here and tell you a little bit about what I've been working on with Sargassum over the past four decades. Can you hear me all right? We sure can. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all for uh, uh, paying attention today and attending the webinar. I'm going to uh, talk about some secrets I've revealed through four decades of research with sargassum. Uh, there are two species that I've been working with since the 1980s based out of a field station here on Big Pine Key, where I am today. And there are sargassum fluitans, the larger plant you see on the left, and sargassum natans, the much finer plant. And these live their entire lives floating around the North Atlantic basin. And uh, you can see the map on the left, the currents that circulate them from the Caribbean up into the Gulf of Mexico, around the Florida Keys, up the Gulf Stream, and then into the Sargasso Sea, which of course is their namesake. And there are a number of forms, but only these two species. So sargassum provides habitat to over 100 species of invertebrates like you see here. Uh, many of these are camouflaged to mimic the sargassum to avoid predators, and also over 100 species of fishes. Uh, most notably, the ambush predator, Histrio histrio, you see on the left. That's an endemic species that lives its entire life in sargassum. So these invertebrates and fishes provide essential fish habitat uh, as designated by NOAA. So it's a protected habitat like a seagrass bed or a coral reef. You cannot harvest it uh, from the water, for example. And it does provide critical habitat for sea turtles such as Coretta Coretta, the loggerhead sea turtle. So in recent decades, uh, there's been a lot of focus in the scientific community as to how we humans are altering the nutrient cycles on our planet. Uh, this chart comes from a, a great paper by Rockstrom in 2009, showing how we have more than doubled the amount of nitrogen, uh, reactive nitrogen on our planet through fertilizer production and population growth. Uh, the phosphorus isn't going up quite as fast as the nitrogen. And so the ratio of the human nutrient load to the oceans is 28 to 1, higher than the background red field nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of 16 to 1. And that's having profound effects just by itself, the imbalance that we're now seeing in that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And of course, one of the things excess nutrients do 
uh, in the ocean is create dead zones, which reduces the biological diversity. And you can see the genetic diversity and the excess nitrogen are two of the biggest issues facing uh, risk in the future uh, health of our planet. So my hypothesis was that with increasing human population growth, that sargassum circulating from the Gulf of Mexico around Florida into the Sargasso Sea could be seeing increasing nutrients coming from land-based sources and atmospheric deposition. And I began to test this hypothesis in the 1980s. You can see these uh, the Gulf Stream map, the, the warm and cold core rings that can carry sargassum uh, into the Sargasso Sea to the east, an aerial photo of the weed lines, and then a close-up of these sargassum weed lines as they move around the ocean. So in the 1980s, um, we did this baseline work uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and supported by research vessels, like you see here, the Cape Hatteras and Columbus Island. Uh, so that's what we call the baseline neuritic and oceanic, where we collected plants out in the Sargasso Sea, all the way from the northern Sargasso to the southern, also up and down the Gulf Stream around the Florida Keys, the Caribbean. And then in 2010, after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we got more funding and began sampling uh, around the Gulf of Mexico, up the Gulf Stream, around the Caribbean. And we extended our sampling all the way off the coast of Brazil to the area of the Amazon plume. And on these ships back in the 1980s, we had flowing seawater where we could grow the sargassum in these cages, these black mesh cages. We could measure photosynthetic rates in, in jars with uh, oxygen electrodes. And we could also harvest and, and process the tissue for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And this is a, an example of uh, measuring photosynthetic rates on the fan tail of one of the research vessels with all the jars set up. And uh, what you see, the photosynthesis irradiance curves, uh, that the neuritic or the nearshore plants are much more productive than those out in the open ocean in the Sargasso Sea. And the reason is they have more nitrogen uh, in their tissue, meaning a, a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. As you go from left to right along those bar graphs, we're going from neuritic to oceanic all the way to the southern sargasso. And you can see how these plants become more and more nitrogen limited uh, with a neuritic or near shore average of 27 to 1 and an oceanic average of about 47 to 1 much higher than the red field ratio, the background of the ocean is 6.6. .6. So they're quite nitrogen limited. And even more so for phosphorus, that uh, again, you see the same trend of higher phosphorus, lower C to P ratios in these near shore areas, averaging 270 to one. And as you move into the Sargasso Sea, that goes way up to almost 800 to one very high compared to the Redfield ratio, three times higher in the Sargasso than the near shore areas. So we really have dual nutrient limitation of both nitrogen and phosphorus in these plants. Well, if we fast forward now to 2011, we saw this whole new oceanographic phenomena that we call the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And this is a new region of distribution of sargassum we'd never seen before. It extends all the way from the west coast of Africa across the tropical Atlantic towards the uh, the Brazil area and the Amazon plume area, then up through the, and around the Caribbean up into the Gulf of Mexico. 8,850 kilometers long, making it the certainly the largest seaweed bloom uh, on earth, but also the largest algae bloom in general. And you can see that that Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is well to the south of the Sargasso Sea. And it developed seasonally uh, since 2011, growing and blooming uh, through the spring months, peaking in the mid-summer. And it has increased in size since 2011, uh, reaching a, a peak year in 2018. 
So we began to think, let's look at the nutrients uh, back in the 1980s and compare that to what we have seen uh, post-2010. And we published that in this article in Nature Communications back in 2011. We found the carbon content went up, uh, as did the nitrogen content, meaning more growth. That limiting nutrient uh, clearly can increase the growth of these plants. Interestingly, the phosphorus actually went down, uh, resulting in an increase in the N to P ratio that went up from about 12 or 13 up to 28 to 1, which again reflects that higher N to P ratio from the human based nutrients coming into the ocean. We have our best data from Lou Key uh, Reef, just south of me here on Big Pine Key, where we can collect it year round. We don't need the big research vessels. We can go out in small boats and collect it uh, offshore Lou Key Reef. And what we have found that uh, we see the highest nitrogen levels in the winter time. Uh, they haven't changed much since the 1980s, but look what happens in the spring, summer, and fall. We are now seeing higher nitrogen year round in these plants, meaning they can grow more year round, produce more biomass, and perhaps contribute seed plants to that great Atlantic sargassum belt. Now we, for the first time, got an opportunity using uh, the RV Thomas G. Thompson to sample plants along two transects in 2021 uh, down into the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. You see the A20 transect and the A22. Uh, both of these show relatively high nitrogen and phosphorus in the Northern Sargasso Sea, but depleted nitrogen and phosphorus in the Central Sargasso Sea, just like we saw back in the 1980s. But look at the Caribbean and the Western tropical Atlantic off the Amazon plume there, you can see again, high nitrogen and phosphorus. These were the first data that really showed elevated nutrients contributing to the growth of sargassum in the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. Uh, this was all made possible by collaboration with Dennis McGillicuddy uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution who provided um, uh, volunteers with the information to collect these plants and process them uh, so we could analyze their nutrient contents. So beginning in 2014, we began to see massive amounts of sargassum coming ashore around the Caribbean and right here in South Florida. These are just some photos over the years showing the inundation. And, you know, sargassum is, is wonderful when it's offshore providing essential fish habitat. But when it comes on shore like this in excessive amounts of biomass, it can have catastrophic effects on water quality and other issues as well. So we began to look at that in the Florida Keys in three state parks. Uh, and the one I'm gonna talk about today is John Pennycamp State Park. And what we find is that as these plants come ashore, they land up in the mangroves, or in canals, uh, some of these coastal areas, they start to decompose. They get trapped in there and bacteria break them down, releasing nutrients, ammonium and phosphate, contributing to algae blooms, native algae that are then recycling those nutrients and creating much bigger blooms than we've seen in the past. For example, Clodophora, that green alga in John Penny Camp, was covering the bottom around these blooms. And this red seaweed, Bryothamnion, down below, has become extremely abundant along the uh, southeasterly shoreline of Big Pine Key, where these plants are decomposing and releasing nutrients. They also create dead zones. Um, and, you know, when the oxygen goes down, becomes anoxic or even hypoxic, we begin to smell those very foul odors of hydrogen sulfide which can be uh, toxic to humans. And in the French islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe during that 2018 massive uh, bloom event, uh, the doctors there diagnosed over 12,000 people with acute exposure to toxic uh, hydrogen sulfide. So it is a, a health concern that uh, people need to be aware of. Also coastal acidification, 
again, from all the microbial activity breaking down the biomass, we see suppressed pH uh, as a result of CO2 enrichment in the water. And this can have effect uh, you know, on the well-being of wildlife in the area and calcification of the types of algae, for example, that produce calcium carbonate and help build the beaches and corals as well. So this past spring in March, we saw the largest amount of sargassum in the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt for that time of year we've ever seen. It was bigger than the record year of, of 2018. And we began to see a lot of it come in very, very early, as early as February. Usually we don't see it coming in until uh, April or May. So we were very concerned that this could be a new record year because typically it, it peaks in June or July. Uh, and of course, that story went viral. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen it on television or, or the media, uh, which referred to it as the blob. And it kind of looks like a blob on the satellite image. Uh, but in fact, it's not really a blob, uh, as you've seen in the photos. Uh, so this was uh, a, a big, big concern, something we were preparing for. And the, and the good news is this blob did not continue to grow uh, to, to its maximum size that we were expecting by uh, June of last year. And that may be due to the changing weather. Um, the Amazon River that provides nutrients to it, uh, we've seen a severe drought this year. And the westerly winds this year also kind of blew it, kept it out of the Caribbean region. So uh, we're still working on that to really look at the dynamics. There are a lot of moving parts to the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. But one of our concerns and something we're working on uh, with Dr. Peter Morton at Texas A&M University is the arsenic content uh, in the sargassum. This is something that um, uh, managers need to be aware of. It has quite a bit of arsenic in the tissue. And it looks like as these plants become more limited by phosphorus, that their arsenic to phosphorus ratio goes up below a tissue level of about 0.1% phosphorus. And so, um, you know, if, if we're going to be repurposing uh, sargassum for fertilizers or feedstocks, this is something that we have to look at very carefully. And finally, um, it's clear that this new Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is having really serious environmental, human health, and economic impacts in the Caribbean and here in South Florida as well. You can see uh, in Mexico, the Riviera Maya, all these people out there with shovels and pitch pitchforks trying to clean the beach and make it uh, acceptable for the the major tourist industry that they have there. Uh, another problem we're seeing where you use heavy equipment, you're literally taking the beach away to the to the landfill with the sargassum. We're seeing a serious beach erosion problem, many areas of the Caribbean. And in some areas, they're using these barriers like an oil boom to try to hold the sargassum off of the, the beach and the coastal areas. And they work fine under low winds and low currents, but that middle photo on the bottom, you can see under high winds and surge, the, the uh, sargassum either goes over or under those, those barriers and gets onto the beach. And the idea is to eventually develop harvesting methods along these barriers where the sargassum can be harvested and repurposed for uh, the benefit of mankind. And with that, I just want to wrap up. Uh, these are a, a lot of the different agencies that have funded my research with sargassum over, over the years and see if uh, you have any questions for me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I really enjoyed having this opportunity to learn from you about the issue um, and the sources and the impacts of sargassum. Uh, we're now going to begin our Q&A portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. So if anyone is tuning in, has anyone any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and I'll go ahead and ask them on your behalf. We're going to start with Ken, who understands the issue, the importance of this issue, why sarcasm has expanded and why it has become such a problem uh, for beaches and boats and all that, but would like to know, is there anything we can realistically do about it other than continuously cleaning our beaches of that toxic stuff? 
Well, that's a great question because this is uh, something that can be um, reused as a, a potential resource. One of the things that, um, and, and there are many, many different efforts going on right now to look at everything from um, biofuel production to sinking sargassum in the open ocean as, for carbon sequestration, uh, and, you know, to mitigate climate change, uh, to production of nanofibers um, as a replacement for single-use plastics. And that one, uh, to me, is very exciting because I think most of the listeners must know that we have a serious plastic pollution problem in the ocean. And the research that's being done is showing that sargassum produces a very high quality uh, nanocellulose that is biodegradable and could, could potentially replace a lot of these non-biodegradable plastics that we see building up in the Sargasso Sea, actually. So, um, and other things, fertilizers, um, feedstocks are, are other things that are being looked at. But again, uh, we're very concerned about the high arsenic content. We're looking at that right now, looking at the various forms of arsenic. It's the inorganic form of arsenic that is most toxic. And that seems to be the, the, the major form of arsenic in sargassum. So um, we're, we're looking, you know, there are people looking at all these potential uses. In fact, this year, we do have funding uh, from the state of Florida. We're going to be working with industrial partners who are looking at all these various uses of sargassum uh, to hopefully come up with some solutions as to what to do with, with all this biomass. Thank you. We're going to move on to Gary, who mentioned uh, you talked about high nutrients coming out of the Amazon. Do you think we have similar effects with flow coming out of the Everglades and Okeechobee? Another great question. Uh, this is something I've been working on for 40 years. I have long term data uh, from Lou Key Reef that I showed in my talk. And as I think many of the listeners know, there's been um, policies put in place to send more water south from Lake Okeechobee through the Everglades as part of Everglades restoration, but also to try to restore the flow of fresh water to Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. You know, there was, I think, a perception years ago that high salinity in Florida Bay was actually killing the turtle grass. And some actually were claiming it was, it was too high even for the corals. And that that is when we, we began to see a lot of water come south uh, from Lake Okeechobee as part of that restoration plan. But unfortunately, things got much worse, not better. Uh, the algae blooms in Florida Bay grew and the coral died faster the more water uh, was sent south. And I published a paper on that in 2019 in the journal Marine Biology. And that's when we realized how connected Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades, Florida Bay and the coral reefs of the Florida, how linked those ecosystems are, not just for salinity, but nitrogen in particular. And so, yes, um, we, we see that uh, nitrogen coming through Florida Bay all the way out to the reef because of the high nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of that water in the Everglades. It has an N to P ratio of about 260 to one, okay? The ocean, remember, was 16 to one. So during these periods, these wet periods, when uh, we have strong rainfall from El Nino uh, weather patterns, we actually can see that nitrogen come down more as those flows increase and that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio goes up. So yes, that is definitely supplying some of this increasing nitrogen and the high N to P ratios we're seeing in sargasso. And not just the Everglades, but also the Mississippi River as well. We're saying, seeing the same thing with that Mississippi River plume. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Bob asks, since sargasm photosynthesizes and uses CO2, shouldn't it help with increasing CO2 in ocean acidification? Well, 
Uh, that is true in terms of the uptake of CO2. However, when it decomposes along shore like that, it is then releasing that fixed carbon back to the atmosphere in the form not just of CO2, which we saw the acidification, um, but also methane. Okay. So in order for sargassum to take that fixed carbon and actually um, mitigate, uh, you know, CO2 buildup in the atmosphere, we have to sink it deep in the ocean where that CO2 will not be mineralized by bacteria and come back up uh, into the surface layer of the ocean and the ultimately the atmosphere. So right, right now, as this great Atlantic sargassum belt is growing and expanding and then rotting and decomposing, that unfortunately is is not not really helping the uh, you know the the CO two uh, increase in our atmosphere that we are that we are seeing. We need to figure out a way to bury that carbon so we can keep it out of the atmosphere and and um, break that cycle that that carbon cycle. Sure. Um, Linda is in attendance from wildbluesea.org, and she's wondering if you have any particular key points you recommend sharing with the general public about the current state of sargassum. Well, I would say that um, we we have to realize that offshore sargassum is still a, a benefit to our, our planet, that it does provide uh, important habitat functions for fisheries, uh, critical habitat for sea turtles. But when it comes on shore it, it, in mass and not not so much in small amounts, uh, but in mass, like these massive inundations, that is when it, it turns uh, from a basically essential fish habitat to a harmful algal bloom. Okay. And I would say um, we need to make people aware of that. I know there are a lot of different opinions as to what to do with sargassum. Some would say, oh gosh, it's all natural. Let's just leave it on the beach and let nature run its course. Well, um, unfortunately, when we see so much land inundation on beaches, we're seeing you know, mortality of, of sea turtles on the beaches. They bury nests, the uh, neonatal sea turtles when they hatch they have a hard time getting through the sargassum to the sea. So it's, this is unfortunately, um, we believe kind of an unnatural situation, okay? This excessive amount of biomass that uh, really calls for protection of our beaches in Florida. Uh, not to mention things like fecal contamination that can also be associated with sargassum if you know, septic tanks and other wastewater sources with the high populations we have here in Florida, we can see increasing closure of beaches when we see all this sargassum coming in and, and decomposing. Uh, so there, and, and heavy metals, you know, if you leave it on the beach and you get buildup of arsenic uh, in on the beaches, you know, that can be an issue as well and other metals. So, I think we we need to let the public know that the the state is moving forward with scientific approaches to best management practices, and this is already happening in the Caribbean. Uh, looking at how barriers can be used safely in an environmentally sensitive way to try to protect the beaches, uh, both for the wildlife and, of course, for the humans as well. And we are just starting to do this. And it's more complicated here in the United States because of the, the rules, the regulations pertaining to essential fish habitat. We can, we can harvest sargassum off the beaches in Florida. And, and that's done routinely in many popular public beaches. But we cannot harvest from the water as they're doing around the Caribbean. And I think um, we're seeing a lot of interest now in doing that, uh, once again, to try to protect our beaches going forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Cantwell's class of 11th and 12th graders are wondering if the arsenic content of sargassum 
will ultimately decrease the biodiversity of animals using it as a habitat? Well, that's a great question. It's something I think about a lot because we could already be seeing a decrease in the biodiversity in, in sargassum. There was a paper in 2014 by scientists at the Bermuda Biological Station who have been studying sargassum and, and its invertebrates for many, many decades. And they reported a pretty dramatic reduction in, in, uh, in faunal uh, densities in sargassum. And I can tell you the the fishers here in, in the Florida Keys, with the massive amounts of sargassum we are seeing in recent years, you don't see the high density of fishes that we once saw. Uh, the um, little jacks that live in schools just under the mats of sargassum, but even file fish and, and invertebrates. And so we don't know exactly what is causing this. There are a number of different explanations. One could be that, well, algae grows faster than, than fish or, or invertebrates, right? When you add uh, nitrate and ammonia or phosphate to the water, these sargassum plants respond immediately and can double their growth in a couple of weeks. Well, you know, the, uh, the fishes and the invertebrates just can't grow that fast. So, are we just seeing kind of a thinning out of the, the fauna that's associated with sargassum? Or are we seeing effects of, say, arsenic toxicity or even hypoxia and anoxia during nighttime when these big, thick mats of sargassum, they're respiring at night, consuming oxygen? And that could uh, be, a, be a real issue for habitat quality that could also be negatively affecting uh, the fishes and invertebrates. But the arsenic issue is definitely one I, we think that could be playing a role here with the decreasing biodiversity. And it's something, again, we're going to be looking at with Dr. Peter Morton in the coming years. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Joe asks how sargassum is specifically affecting corals off Florida, for example, bleaching and diseases and other situations. Okay, another another great question. We're actually going to be writing a paper soon on that topic because we have 40 years of data, water quality data at Lou Key, and we actually have satellite imagery in since the year 2000 to be able to quantify how much sargassum has come in. And this photo we're looking at right now, that's Lou Key Reef. Look at that mat of sargassum. That's like an island-sized mat of sargassum covering the reef and look at the color of the water okay uh typically you know you go out to luke and you see beautiful clear blue water that green water and turbidity uh is <laughs> that is a problem for coral reefs uh you know that water's got to have relatively high nutrients in it and in fact the highest nitrate concentrations we have seen at Lou Key in 40 years have been associated with events just like this, where the sargassum comes in and over the reef and fish, you know, Bermuda chubs and other fish, yellowtail go up and feed in and around the sargassum. And I, I think it, it causes leaching of, of this dissolved nitrogen in the form of of nitrate and and possibly ammonium as well. So that is going to be an issue for the health of corals at Lou Key. And as I showed in my talk, we began to see this massive inundation of sargassum in 2014. Okay. Uh, not just the Florida Keys, but even up towards Miami and Miami Beach. And so what happened in 2014, other than this beginning of the massive influx, stony coral tissue loss disease became a major issue. We began to see very rapid mortality of live corals. And in fact, pillar coral is now functionally extinct in the Florida Keys, okay? Now, this, this correlates exactly with this massive inundation of sargassum. And we know as sargassum comes in, it has a microbiome 
uh, bacteria that live on these plants that could be playing a role in seeding these reefs with harmful bacteria. Um, that's something I think that, you know, the research is going to have to reveal to us in, in the coming years, what role is just that microbiome playing uh, in the potential loss of, of corals and, and potentially spreading diseases um, up and up and down the coast from the Caribbean up uh, into the Florida Keys and beyond. So uh, it's clear from the research done in Mexico and the work we're doing that it is not it is not helping and it's very likely uh, a major stressor on coral reef communities. I understand. Thank you. Rosanna has heard that the Gulf Stream is slowing down and wonders if you think this would have an impact on sargassum. Well, it, it certainly uh, would um, because, you know, we there's this dynamic circulation I talked about in my talk whereby the, the sargassum moves up the east coast of Florida and the United States on its way to the Sargasso Sea. So if the Gulf Stream is slowing down, you, you could have, for example, just higher residence time of sargassum in these coastal areas where they're seeing more abundant nutrients in the water. Um, Everglades runoff, one source. Uh, look at Miami-Dade and Broward counties. We've got major ocean outfalls of wastewater that those, you know, those plumes come right up to the surface and that sargassum as it's moving north on the, the west edge of the uh, of the Gulf Stream and Florida current, it's going right through those nutrients. So if it's going through a little bit more slowly, it's going to have more time to assimilate the nutrients like nitrogen, which we know is going up in sargassum. And, uh, and it would have more time to grow, double its biomass. So that certainly could be another factor um, that could be contributing to the, the buildup of nutrients in sargassum. Sure. Linda shares, there's so many fascinating species associated with sargassum. Will you share a few of your favorites and why? Well, I got to say my favorite is the Histrio Histrio, the, um, that ambush predator, the sargassum frogfish. And if, if you would like to know more about this, I would encourage you to go to YouTube and Google Dr. Brian LaPointe, uh, Secrets of the Sargasso Sea, a uh, lecture, a one-hour lecture I gave back in 2011, where I showed footage of a mating pair, a male and a female, uh, uh, histrio, histrio. And it is the only footage, to my knowledge, ever shown publicly how they mate, how the female releases eggs that are then fertilized by the male. Okay. And it's such striking, um, footage and i i worked with nhk broadcasting in tokyo japan they came to the florida keys and we sailed for several weeks up the gulf stream uh filming sargassum this was in 1997 with one of the early sony high definition camera systems and you'll you'll get to see uh that whole effort uh that we made back then to, to film sargassum and the amazing biodiversity that it contains. So um, again, that's that's available on, on YouTube. And I just recently was contacted by the BBC. They're working on Blue Planet 3 right now, and they want to come work with me next year and try to repeat that uh, filming of, of the the sargassum frogfish, the spawning uh, yeah, that I filmed earlier with the, with the Japanese uh, journalists and, and videographers with NHK. And so we're hoping to try to repeat that with more modern, um, you know, video and camera uh, technology. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll succeed in doing that next year. But uh, all these, uh, some of my other favorites are the sargassum file fish. Uh, they're amazing. You know, they live right up and inside 
these seaweed mats. Other fishes like jacks tend to form schools just below the bottom of the mat. So you get a layering effect. And of course, the swimming crabs are, are fun to watch too. As you go up and poke around in these mats snorkeling, you know, you can see these crabs. Uh, sometimes they will fall out and start to sink. And you can see how they swim upwards very quickly, try to get back into that sargassum that allows them to float and be buoyant uh, in the ocean. So it's an amazing uh, experience to, to, you know, go out into blue water and to snorkel around these, um, these sargassum mats. I often refer to that community as a floating reef. Okay. And a lot of those organisms come from benthic habitats in coastal areas and scientists long ago, referred to them as the displaced benthos, that these are benthic or bottom-dwelling organisms that have adapted to life floating around the Atlantic in the sargassum community. Very interesting. We have time for just a few more questions. And our next one is from Becky, who asks, if you have studied uh, other algae and ocean plants besides sargassum. Yeah, Becky, thanks for that. I, I have studied a lot of different types of algae. Um, I have been working, uh, for example, in the Indian River Lagoon on the harmful algae that are causing the, you know, the catastrophic loss of seagrasses and starvation of manatees. Um, one of the things I study is sources of nitrogen using nitrogen isotopes. And we actually use these seaweeds in the Indian River Lagoon, like the red seaweed gracilaria or the green seaweed calerpa. These have become very, very abundant in the Indian River Lagoon uh, due to uh, largely the human waste uh, coming from, from septic tanks and other sources. Um, old uh, wastewater infrastructure that um, needs uh, upgrading. So we, we use these really like little bioobservatories to tell us what the source of the nitrogen is, whether it's fertilizer, nitrogen that has a distinct isotopic signature from human waste. So I, I've done a lot of that work in, in the Indian River Lagoon, and hopefully that's going to help guide the restoration of the lagoon and, and cleaning up the human waste. That is a big, big part of the problem there. But I'm also studying the blue-green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee, the St. Lucie Estuary, and the Caloosahatchee Estuary. In fact, I'm, I'm working on a paper right now uh, talking about the nitrogen. Once again, nitrogen, increasing nitrogen is the common thread that ties all these algae blooms from sargassum uh, in the open ocean to to the blooms in the Indian River Lagoon, to the blue-green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee, they're all responding to increasing nitrogen from human activities. And we are looking very carefully now at these blue-green algae blooms, Microcystis aruginosa, and how water from the north of the lake, all the way from Orlando, you know, coming down the Kissimmee Basin, is bringing in more nitrogen and phosphorus uh, but at, uh, what we're seeing is just what I've been talking about with sargassum. The N to P ratio is going up in Lake Okeechobee. The nitrogen is going up. And we've heard a lot about limiting phosphorus, right, in Lake Okeechobee and the importance of mitigating sources of phosphorus. Well, you haven't heard so much about nitrogen. And hopefully this new paper and the data we have is going to convince you know our agencies that we we need to really tighten our belts with regard to nitrogen if we want to try to moderate and mitigate this growing trend of toxic blue green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee and the estuaries. Yeah. Um, next up, we have Tim, who's curious if you see bigger blooms in years when Saharan sand dust Saharan dust is heavier. Mm -hmm. Well, we have been looking for a direct link between Saharan dust and in these sargassum blooms. And certainly when you look on the maps at the dust plumes coming over, 
you know, there is an overlay, you know. However, the timing of the dust, you know, we haven't really been able to make a, a one-to-one correspondence. It's something we're, we're still looking at. And I'm working uh, with, again, Dr. Peter Morton at Texas A&M, who is a really great chemical oceanographer. He's working on atmospheric inputs of nutrients and metals. And um, I, I anticipate that we'll be, be trying to crack that crack the code on that question in the in the coming years as we get more data we're trying to get financial support from the agencies to go out and really carefully monitor not just the saharan dust that can provide iron for example for nitrogen fixation uh in in the sargassum community but potentially phosphorus as well but biomass burning also in africa is another potential source atmospheric source of phosphorus and iron that we're also looking at. And that might even be the bigger source compared to the Saharan dust. So uh, those are two things that we're, we're definitely going to be looking at more in the coming years. Sure. We're going to wrap up with one final question in today's session. And this one is from Tiffany, who uh, uh, Tiffany's class, who wants to know what type of scientist you would describe yourself as? Did you have to do a lot of schooling and what type of classes are important to take in your line of work? Well, that's a, a really great question. And I, you know, I grew up in West Palm Beach. I went to Palm Beach High School in the 1960s and just, you know, it was like a dream living in Florida back then. The coral reefs were all alive. The water was so crystal clear. It was just a thrill as a young boy to go over to the beach off the Breakers Hotel and snorkel on coral reefs and go down to the Florida Keys in high school with my biology class and see uh, John Penny Camp State Park. So that was an uh, inspiration, you know, for me. To I, I realized early on that I wanted to be a marine scientist. And of course, coming from Florida, I, I had a hunch that water quality was going to be a big issue at some point in Florida because everyone wants to move there and live there and, and enjoy uh, the biodiversity and aquatic resources in Florida. So I went to Boston University as an undergrad because they had a great uh, uh, marine program called the BUMP program that led me down to Woods Hole to meet some of the top ocean scientists in the world. And so that's one lesson. If you know, if you really know what you're passionate about in in you know in, in any area of ocean science, try to go and find you know a professor that really excels in that particular area. And that's what I did. I found a mentor who was really um, the top gun in in terms of uh, research on nitrogen and harmful algal blooms and. That changed my life, working with him for four years at Woods Hole Oceanographic. But I missed Florida. I came back to University of Florida, got my master's degree in environmental science and engineering because I personally wanted to have an applied approach to marine science to fix problems, not just study problems. And as you can see around Florida today, there are plenty of these water quality problems that need fixing. So my hunch was right way back uh, decades ago. And again, I would, I would say, um, you know, pursue your, your dream and never give up. I ended up getting my PhD after my master's at University of South Florida, worked with uh, a, a wonderful professor, Dr. Clinton Dawes, uh, where I learned a lot about the seaweeds of Florida and marine botany and moved directly to the Florida Keys for a postdoc, a two-year postdoc. Uh, and I'm still here 40 years later. Uh, I, I enjoy this work so much. And um, yeah, I, I hope um, that's an inspiration to a lot of you today. Um, I really encourage you all to, to move on into this field because we are going to need a whole new generation of scientists to follow my generation because of, of what's happening to our planet. Um, and so... With that, I guess I guess we'll wrap things up. Yeah, well, we can't thank you enough. We really appreciate your time this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you and learn from you. I'm looking forward to going to YouTube and learning more about your work and hopefully BBC down the road. 
Um, again, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. And thanks again for all of you viewers for attending the webinar today. Yeah, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Stephanie at this point. Thanks, Brian, and thank you again, Dr. LaPointe, for sharing Secrets of Sarcasm with us today. If you'd like to take a look at the K-12 education and outreach uh, resources we have regarding this topic, they're made available to you along with the recording of today's program on the University of Florida Thompson Earth Systems YouTube channel. And please, if you would, take a moment to complete the survey. The link will be found in the chat box for you now. Finally, if you are interested in learning more about the Scientists in Every Florida School program or Anjari Foundation, you can visit our websites, follow us on social media. All of those links and information are found here on the slide. So while this is our last live stream event for Ocean Expert Exchange for the fall season, we have great plans ahead for the spring series. So we encourage you to stay tuned to learn about the upcoming topics. We also wanna thank everyone for joining us today for today's event, and we hope you have a very happy and healthy holiday. We look forward to seeing you in the future at Future Ocean Expert Exchange.